Am I all in? And each one of us needs to ask ourselves that personally. Am I all in? And so if you'll turn to Genesis chapter 7, we'll start there. And uh, we've got a few verses to read. Um, but again, just, just stay with me on this, and we'll, we'll see if we can't answer that question individually. Maybe even as a church. So Genesis chapter 7, it's a story here of the flood. Uh, we're all probably most fa- familiar with it. We won't read much of this, but just to kind of read a few verses to get some context here. Uh, 7 and verse 1, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. So here we see this Lord speaking to Noah. He sees that this is a righteous man, and he's going to be saved. We all know the, the account of the the flood here. Uh, we won't read all this about the beast. Uh, skip down to maybe verse 4. And once uh, the all the animals were there, and then for seven for yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And so we see that Noah and his family are called into the ark, and then they're to stay there for seven days before it even begins to rain. Verse 5, And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And And Noah had been doing this for a long time. It took him about 120 years to build this ark. So he's been a faithful man. And so they enter the ark. Uh, The the animals two by two. Verse 10, And it came to pass after seven days, after they'd been in the ark there, that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. It talks about how old Noah was and when when it happened. Uh, Verse 12, And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And then uh, the number of people that entered was Noah and his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. And the beast, and verse 15, And they went in unto Noah, into the ark, two and two of all the flesh, wherein is the breath of life. Verse 16, And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare the ark up, and it was lifted up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills, and were under the whole heaven, were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Verse 20, 15 cubits upward did the mount waters prevail. Okay, verse 21, and all the flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man, and all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. Verse 23, And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heavens, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth an hundred and fifty days. So just a few things here. You know, verse 10, we see that Noah and his family, they were in the ark for seven days. Before the rain began, their safety and security came from the Lord, didn't it? You know, we see where it says, and the Lord shut him in. Uh, If we were to to go to Ephesians 1 and 13, we talked about how we are shut in, aren't we? We're shut in by the Holy Spirit that works in and through us. So in verse 17, the ark's lifted up, you know, the same waters that brought death to others. It only lifted the ark higher, didn't it? You know, it lifted it further away from destruction, and the flood's waters beat on the ark, yet everyone inside was safe. And so it is for us as well, those of us that are saved, isn't it? You know, Christ, those that have salvation and eternal hope that things going on around us doesn't really, shouldn't really matter, does it? It doesn't change the salvation that we have. 
And so we kind of see, you know, when, there in verses 21 through 23, we kind of see this reign of death upon those who reject God. Our God is sovereign, isn't he? Maybe we don't understand this. Maybe it doesn't make any sense to it. Maybe it doesn't have to. Our God is sovereign. He does as he pleases. You know, and it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so that's what we see. And as we think about this account, I think that God put it here. You know, if we were to read, it holds your place there, but look in Hebrews 10 and verse 31. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so we see that. We see that in other accounts throughout the Scripture, that this is what happens. If those that don't accept things, those that wouldn't listen to Noah and his family, they realize this judgment that came upon them through the flood. This is what the people at the time were faced with, Noah were, were faced with, and ignored the warnings from Noah. You know, it's possible maybe at first they were curious, probably asked questions. It's possible that maybe some initially took him seriously. But you know, after 120 years, they probably thought, this man is crazy. What is he doing? This boat is not even in the water. It's a big boat. It's a big ark. How is he going to get it to the water? So they, I, I, don't, I won't say that you know, necessarily they were laughing, but they were probably making fun of Noah thought that this was ridiculous. And all that we'd see and realize the seriousness of what's going on in our world today. You know, when we think about this and what the people were doing and what they were looking at, is that the way they look at us now, those of us that are saved? You know, they do whatever they want to do, and God doesn't punish them. They think, well, what's the big deal? You know, the wickedness, but it certainly cannot be pleasing to God, can it? If you turn back there to uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 6, uh, we see, well, actually, let's go back to verse 5 there, just prior to the flood there. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every, can you imagine? Every imagination... I mean, it was pretty bad. I mean, and, and when we compare to what's going on now, it's, we think that it's pretty bad, isn't it? Even in our day and age. But it got to a point where God was not pleased with these things. And verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in, in his heart, at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Verse 8, but someone found grace, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know, who can stand before a God undeserving of judgment? Nobody can. The wicked shall not go unpunished. Most of us learn from our own mistakes. But can we learn from the mistakes of others? Can we look back at this, what happened at the flood, and, and see this, maybe even see this as a nation, and think what, you know, God at some point may do something, you know, may be in control. Can we look back at this horrific, horrific event that occurred and learn something from it? We as a nation, can we do that? You know, we... Uh, we won't turn there, but, you know, we, we know the story about Job as well and how he, you know, God allowed Satan to do some things to Job. Uh, one of his friends there spoke to him and said, Hast thou marked the old way which was wicked men have trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood? So these, they looked back and they knew, they realized what had happened, what that nation had gotten to. And so as these two men were talking about these things, as we talk about these things, do we consider these things? And remember the question that I've asked you in the beginning, am I all in? And this, you know, I want you to think about these things because, you know, the world will ask this same question and answer, the answer for them is nothing. I can do this on my own. I don't need God. That's what we're seeing. I'm self-sustaining. 
You know, when terrible things happen to people, what do they do? Does it push them away from God or does it push them closer to God? You know, do we, we, do we look at this thing and how can God allow these things to happen? And maybe at times we do question these things. But God is sovereign, remember that. And as we think about this, and, and um, you know, I, I just to look back, uh, uh, you remember a time here when this nation was struggling at 9-11. You know, it was an event, it was terrible, it was bad. Is that what this nation did when that happened? Did we turn back to God? Were the events of that day a warning? Possibly it was. I don't know. Did it cause us to turn to God? I think there was some turning back. But how dare anyone imply that God allowed this to happen, you know, because we failed to serve him, because we are no longer a godly nation. We increased our security. We beefed up our defenses. We created homeland security. We made 90-year-old grandmothers take their shoes off in the airport for fear that they're carrying a bomb. You know, we did a lot of things. But was there any pause to think that maybe there's something more to this? Do we serve a sovereign God? If he's in control, then he allowed this to happen. Why did it happen? No pause to think that maybe this nation had lost its focus, no longer represented what our founding fathers had intended it to be. This nation was established in part with a covenant with God to always be a God-fearing nation. It's on our money. In God we trust. I've got, um, I got a quote here. I, I want to read some of this. A quote from Abraham Lincoln. I may, and I may have read this before, maybe in our Sunday school class, but, uh, you know, he was president, civil wars going on, a terrible time. And here's what he said as he was being inaugurated. The Almighty, he's referring to God, the Almighty has his own purposes. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? The Almighty has his own purposes. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. In other words, he's telling these people, you, got to, you want this war to go away? What do you do? You go to God. You pray. You don't necessarily, I mean, God can use us to fix the problem, but you need to go to God first. Yes, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled up by the bondsman, 250 years of unrequited toll shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, this is Abraham Lincoln still speaking, that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. I think if a politician wants to say that, they probably get run out. I mean, that's, that's, that's where we're at. And you think, how far away can we get? This was just a couple of hundred years ago. We, we see a nation in turmoil at that time and a leader that sees it as judgment from God. Judgment from a righteous God. The Almighty has his own purposes and he's a sovereign God and that's what Abraham Lincoln was telling these people. So if you fast forward to 9-11, uh, you have an event in our U.S. history. It's not probably, it wasn't as bad as the Civil War. I'm not trying to make it out to be, but um, there was a, a lot went on at the time, but on the third anniversary, I have, I've, I have a few other quotes here I want to read. Uh, and I think this was either a vice president or a vice presidential candidate. Uh, he was speaking in Washington, D.C., and he said, Good morning. Today, on this day of remembrance and mourning, we have the Lord's word to get us through. So it sounds good, doesn't? and it is good that they referred to the Lord's word. And so he, he quotes you want to turn to Isaiah 9, verse 10, this is what he quotes. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 10. 
again, I, if, if somebody stands before people, a, a leader in this nation, and quotes something from the scripture, it's great. I think it's wonderful. But what he said here, this is what he said, and you can, you, as you can look at it there in, the, in your Bible, if you have the King James Version, it's pretty close. It said, the bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. So what, what we see here, if you, take, if you look at the context of this moment, we see Isaiah in Isaiah, a nation that once knew God, but then began to fall away. And God allowed what was about to happen to happen. The enemies that entered the land and caused destruction, but it didn't last. It was a warning to Israel what it was. God was allowing this to happen, a warning of impending doom if they didn't forsake their wicked ways and go back and return to God. It was a sign, a judgment upon a nation. The problem with just quoting that one scripture, well, you don't consider everything that's going on here. If you go on down and you read um, verse 11 there, again, we want to take this and, and what was the context of what was being said here. The bricks are fallen, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. See, it's, it's a lot of we and us. We, and we are going to do this. It doesn't say we with God's help and guidance. Verse 11, Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of Rezin against him and join his enemies together. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. doesn't sound like what they were planning to do is going to have any impact. God was still going to allow some things to happen. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Verse 13, For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth, smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. So the problem is, is they were going to do this themselves. They were going to fix this problem without God's help. And what they really needed to do is just pray about it. Go to God and say, we're wrong. We have, we've been worshiping idols. We've fallen away. We need to go back to what you taught us and do as you taught us to do. And, and so it's interesting, you know, as he quotes, so, and there's a few other quotes that was read, you know, that, that just kind of makes you think that, I, I get it, you know, it's patriotism. This nation is, I don't think there's any other nation like it in the world. Never has been. And I think we can do great things. But we can't do it without God. And I think that's part of the problem here. And so we have the mayor of New York in response to 9-11 we will rebuild. I, that's positive. That's good. We're going to come out of this stronger than before, politically stronger and economically stronger. No reference to God. We're going to do this ourselves. Um, the President of the United States, we will rebuild New York City. You know, you just... I think that's great, that, and we, we need to stand, and we don't need to let terrorism bring us to our knees, but we need to realize and understand that without God, we can't do anything. You know, there's one other quote here that says, I believe one of the first things we should commit to with federal help that underscores our nation's purpose is to rebuild the towers of the World Trade Center and show the world we are not afraid. We are defiant. To be a patriot, that's great, you know, but to, to not say, not to put this back and think this nation needs to get back to God is wrong. And so this, you know, and so as we think about this, you know, let's just take it down to another level to us as individuals. And I think that's where I want to I kind of get to today. Again, the question is, am I all in? You know, we all want to be patriotic and we want to do things and we just want to serve and we want to pledge allegiance. And, you know, there was something the other day that happened. Uh, Michelle was telling me about it that um, I think it was either a baseball game or a softball game or something they were going to play. And the announcer said, we're not going to have the national anthem. And one of the teams walked out on the field and sung the national anthem themselves. 
I think that's great. You know, that, that, that's fine. That, that's part of what the problem is, but it goes beyond that, doesn't it? It goes back to God. In God we trust. And so as we think of this as individuals, and we see what happens to nations in defiance, but how do we as individuals react to what's going on in the world? You know, is our walk with God such that we fear God? Or have we as Christians become complacent, indifferent? What does it matter attitude? I, I have to say, you know, I, it's hard not to get like that, to just get numb to it, to sit through a TV show or a movie and have stuff that 20 years ago you probably you wouldn't even consider watching. And now it's just easy to sit there. I'm, you know, we're all in this. Let's be honest with each other. Am I all in? Am I willing to do what I have to do to serve God? Are we caught up with living that we fail to serve? You know, it, it, there's times, there, there's a scripture in Luke we won't read there. It talks about the Sabbath and the ox and the ditch and how that there's certain things that you can do on the Sabbath day. But do we put our ox in the ditch on Sunday? Do we not serve because we have to do this or that when we should be here? When the circumstances that we're talking about is something that we created? Do we look at this church and think that it's dying? Do we sit around and lament that it's not what it used to be? You know, I, I, when I was younger, I've been in this church a long time. Um, Bible school, uh, we would, I'm thinking that we would have maybe 400 kids in Bible school. Now we probably, we're around 100. And I'm thankful for the 100 that we have. But do you look at that and think, man, this church is not what it used to be? Let me ask you something. If it isn't, if we're talking about me and you and I, if it isn't what it used to be, am I a part of the problem or am I part of the solution? Am I willing to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord come rain or shine? Are you willing to say that? Are you willing to say, I am all in? Look in Joshua 24 and verse 15. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. I mean, there's tremendous truth in the Old Testament. I mean, people say the Old Testament doesn't apply anymore. It does. I mean, there's, the gospel's there. There's things that we can learn. God put them there for us. But when, in Joshua 24, here we see Joshua again, the nation of Israel struggling not being faithful to his word, questioning the things that's going on. Verse, we'll go back to 14. It says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood. In other words, the reason why the flood happened in part was because they were serving false gods. He's telling them, put those things away. And in Egypt, when, while we were in Egypt in slavery and bondage, we participated in what the, the heathens were doing there and how they served. And serve ye the Lord. Verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. Here's what I want you to see. But as for me... In my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Are we willing to say that? Are we willing to commit to that? It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what somebody else is doing. It doesn't matter. I, we've talked about this nation, and it's depressing, and it's, you know, we'd like to see it different. Does it change it? Did it change any of these words? Does it change God's word? It didn't change, nothing changed. We're still to serve. Look in... Uh, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. It 
Verse 7 there, And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged, or atoned there. Verse 8, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. That would be a convicting verse there for a lot of us, shouldn't it? Who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Are we willing to say that? Here am I, Lord, use me. Or do we just sit back and think, well, there's somebody else that's more qualified to do that, to do whatever. Send me, Lord. I can do something. Every person in here, every member of this church is here for a reason. You have a purpose. And maybe it's not to stand up here. Maybe it's not to teach. But maybe it's, it, it's some things that you can do. You're here for a reason. Everybody is here for a reason. You know, the, the state motto that we have here is united we stand, divided we fall. That's the same for this church. Every member is here for a purpose, and we should be united in the purpose that we have, and that's to serve Him. You want to see God work? You want to see God use this church? Then it takes all of us. It really does. It takes every one of us. We all have different abilities, different talents. We all have limitations. But that doesn't mean God can't use you. God puts every member here for a reason. And there's a purpose for you being a part of this church. You know, we, we think that there's always somebody more qualified to do certain things or somebody else will volunteer to do this or that. You know, when Lou and Kenny want somebody to help with dining with dignity and maybe you think, well, there's other people. And I do it. I'm not, you know, this is not just you, it's me. Somebody else will do it. Surely somebody else will volunteer to make desserts or do this or that. Maybe it ought to be you. Maybe we need to develop an attitude. I'm going to help. I'm going to do what I can. Be thankful for what you have and the opportunity you have to serve God in this church and be committed to serve. It's not just attending occasionally and be, that makes you a part of this church. Are you committed to serve? You know, it's interesting. Give me just a minute. Who did God, who did Jesus choose for his 12 apostles? Did he go to schools or universities or whatever they had and try to find the smartest people? Did he go find to temples and look for the people that were the most knowledgeable about the Old Testament? No. He picked fishermen. He picked 12 ordinary men that accomplished great things. Don't think for a minute that God can't use you. Go to, let's look in Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. We won't, here we see a, a parable about Jesus. Again, the question is, am I all in? Uh, Matthew 25 and verse 14. Here we see, uh, we're not going to read all this. We'll read some of it. For the kingdom of heaven is, a, is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. So we have this man. It's a parable. It's a story, earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's what I used to tell my five-year-old Sunday school class. But God, uh, Jesus is using this to, to illustrate and make a point. And so he's leaving and he has three servants and he's going to give each one of them certain things to do. So verse 15, and to one he gave five talents and to another two and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. Key word there. He knew what each one of them was capable of, didn't he? And straightway took his journey. He left. After a while he comes back and what does he find? He finds that the one with five talents now has ten talents. 
he finds the one that has two talents now has four talents. And the one with one talent still has the one talent. And so for the other two, you know, the, the point here is, is, first of all, the rich man, he knew their capabilities of each of these servants. God knows what I'm capable of. He knows what you're capable of. It doesn't mean he can't use you. It doesn't mean you're going to do great things, but maybe you're going to do good things. He knew what this one he gave five, he knew he could probably handle more. The one he gave to two, he knew he could handle some. But, but his response to both of them was, and we see it there in verse 23, his Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. So it didn't matter. I mean, the fact that the one that made five and the other only made two, there wasn't a difference. They, he knew what they were capable of. They both did well. The reward for using your talents is the same. If you have this talent, if you have the, are you a one-talent person? Maybe I'm just a one-talent person. But I still have that one talent, and I still can use it. And I think that's what the parable, that's what Jesus is trying to get us to see. And what am I doing with that one talent that I have? God expects us to do things with our talents. So as we get to the close of this, uh, I'd like for you to turn to Philippians chapter 4, and we're gonna, we'll close with the reading of a few of these verses here in Philippians. Philippians 4 and verse 1. Here we have Paul, and he's, you know, usually Paul writes these letters, and then he usually tries to end with something positive as he's writing to these people. You know, occasionally he has to, you know, kind of point out some things that they're doing wrong, but he always tries to be positive about things. And so verse 1, it says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. So he's, he's making a connection with them. I beseech Eudeus, I beseech Sintache, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. We need to be in the same mind, don't we? A unity. Verse 3, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He's being, he's, you guys got it made. Work together. Do this together. Be be positive and help each, help each other. In verse 5, let your moderations be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Not necessarily going to answer your prayers, but I think he'll give you an answer that'll help you survive and realize and understand that these conflicts are going to happen. Maybe the resolution isn't exactly what you wanted, but God can give you the peace to endure these things. Amen. Verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, just think on these things. Be positive. Rejoice in what you have. Verse 9, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Not all your problems are going to go away, but God will give you peace about how to deal with things and suffer and, do, and get through these things. Verse 10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Verse 11 is where I want us to see, you know, a, a verse that if, if you don't have this marked in your Bible or, or memorized, you ought to think about it. It'd be a good way to start your day here. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned 
in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Can we say that? Boy, it's tough sometimes, isn't it? Things aren't health, your health's bad, you got a bad report. Charles has got, you know, he's gonna find something out maybe this week, good or bad. How you deal with these things? You know, we all have things going on in our lives. We have each other though, don't we? As not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Verse 12, I know, I know these things. He's Paul's, he, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. We're going to go through some trials and tribulations. But man, we, we've got something that other people don't have, don't we? Not only do we have this church and other members to, to kind of help us through these things, but we have the Word of God and we have our salvation. Verse 13, another verse that you ought to have by memory. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. be a great way to start your day. So, as we think about these things, you know, the, the message this morning has mostly been to the church and saved, but certainly if a lost person, if you're here this morning, that, you know, can you ask yourself, what's missing in my life? What do these people have that I don't have? And what we have is the salvation and the tr and faith and trust in what Christ did for us on the cross there. How can I obtain the peace that passes all understanding?